environmental racism, climate crisis, it aggravates and instigates issues like police violence. It's creating issues as far as our collective health. There's interconnectivity with voting rights or with issues regarding homelessness or that affordable housing crisis. It is so obvious how at risk we are for further destruction. It's, it's, it's capitalism because a lot of these decisions are being made purely for revenue, for, for growth. Still coming up on the Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Welcome back. It is that time where the Laura Flanders Show is passed into the very able hands of our colleagues at URL Media. URL Media is a network of black and brown owned media outlets co-founded by our co-hosts, Mitra Kalita and Sarah Lomax Reese. Sarah, I understand that you at WRD Radio in Philly held one of your annual eco justice summits recently. Yes, uh, on Indigenous Peoples Day, we hosted our third annual Eco Word Environmental Justice Summit, and we focused in on the climate crisis, but more specifically, how it is converging with the violence crisis in Philadelphia and um, what we can do tangibly to address uh, violence through nature and the environment. So I can't wait to hear the conversation. Um, take it away. I look forward to checking in with you at the end. Thanks, Laura. It's great to be here for another Meet the BIPOC Press with URL Media. What has always been true is that vulnerable communities are disproportionately impacted by climate change and environmental racism, whether it's factories spewing toxic chemicals that are located near Black neighborhoods or lead in old public school buildings inhabited by Black and brown children, or the pesticides farm workers are ingesting. BIPOC communities are on the front lines of this growing environmental disaster. We're structuring today's conversation as a roundtable on how BIPOC media organizations have been covering these issues and what we will continue to tackle. We're joined by Charles Ellison, who is a host on WURD Radio and the managing editor for EcoWord, and Co Bragg, who is the race and place editor for Scalawag, and Gary Pierre Pierre, who is the publisher of the Haitian Times. And so I wanted to just um, jump off the conversation by really um, asking each of you to speak to how we as BIPOC media organizations uh, approach the climate crisis conversation when we know that black and brown communities are facing so many challenges, whether it's around uh, poverty or uh, health concerns or um, migration issues. How do we center and amplify this issue around climate crisis in BIPOC communities? And uh, maybe I'll start with you, Co. Sure. No, it's a really good question. Um, and I think it's one of those things that I've been thinking through a lot, especially because I moved to New Orleans about a year and a half ago. And I think now we've shifted into a place where our climate crisis is not just something that is only debated in like academia or amongst people who study it, like scientists and things like that, we're at a point where it is so obvious how at risk we are for further destruction. And also it's a, it's a touch point because so many black and indigenous communities have been sounding the alarm about the dangers of pollution and um, just disregard for our planet because we are the ones who live the reality of that neglect. And so I think the great thing about this is that, yes, it's one of those issues where Black and Brown people absolutely should be leading. This is a delayed conversation in part because of the way we fail to listen to Black and Brown communities. Yeah. So Charles, I want to see if you can pick up on that because um, we launched our EcoWord Environmental Justice Initiative in 2018. And one of the things that we've really been focused on is connecting the dots and making our community, our Black Philadelphia community, understand that environmental justice is 
is absolutely critical to us um, and to make it relevant. We're trying to basically uh, reform the conversation and show that it's not about climate crisis over here. It's not about uh, another segregated conversation on environmental racism. No, this is the top priority challenge that we as all BIPOC people, Black, Indigenous, Latino, pe other people of color have been dealing with for generations and centuries now. Um, this actually uh, aggravates and it's, it, it correlates with every other issue that we're dealing with right now. Even uh, environmental racism, climate crisis, it aggravates and instigates issues like police violence. Um, it's creating issues as far as our health, our collective health, or the pandemic. Um, there are even correlations, there's interconnectivity with voting rights issues or with issues regarding homelessness or the housing, affordable housing crisis. All those big challenges that we focus on or we report on daily and regularly have something to do with the environment or this battle or this war for space that we've been going through for so long. I think for um, so many um, black and brown people in America, the journey actually began with climate change. So if we look at our own membership of the URL Media Network, you know, Bangladesh, for example, um, is a country that is one of the, um, you know, almost like the per literally the perfect storm of weather conditions, a low, um, kind of a low lying um, uh, environment, rising sea levels, mm -hmm. and um, just a population that's being displaced every year. And if you look at, you know, migration patterns here in Queens, where I am, um, you know, people can trace their search for space to U.S. shores. Um, I confess that we've tended to cover climate change as something over there until recently in the um, aftermath of Hurricane Ida on September 1st, when New York, as many of you saw the images, uh, was literally underwater. Gary, I don't know if you're gonna take my bait on migration and, uh, and climate change, but, but your, your island nation has been through a lot over the last few months. And I just wonder if there is a climate change angle on, on everything we've been seeing. Oh my God. I mean, uh, climate change, the environment in Haiti is its biggest existential threat. Before we get to Haiti, though, I want to say something about the uh, mig uh, migration and, and, and uh, environment and the whole issue not being at the forefront. All of a sudden, this is a, um, a, a big uh, problem. It's an emergency. I remember it when I was a child growing up in New Jersey. Uh, sucking up fumes from Exxon, who was not too far away off I-95. I think what has happened, as cities across the world have become gentrified, the new residents, I realized the level, the extent of the pollution that we were living with. So all of a sudden, it has, you know, gotten the first uh, rung, and which is which is good. But it's it's, it's I just want to make sure that you know. People know we've been dealing with this for quite quite some time, and 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 the urgency that's surrounding it should have been there, you know, a hundred years ago. Going back to Haiti, uh, everything that we were seeing at the root cause has everything to do with uh, the climate in Haiti. For the last fifty years or so, there's been a uh, deforestation because people still use wood for fuel to cook. And so the government has done very little to stop that, that system. And so therefore, the rain from the uh, hurricane will do catastrophic damage. The earthquakes, the same thing. So Haiti, I think you were talking about Bangladesh. I think w w the biggest story to me out of Haiti is the degradation of the environment. I wanted to, to throw it to Co. New Orleans is absolutely kind of the, the poster child for um, you know, climate crisis in, as an American city. And I want to see if you can talk about how you and Scalawag are, are covering these issues, particularly the piece that you did for Scalawag about Ida and, you know, kind of the insensitivity that people um, express around when, when these kind of climate catastrophes happen, but more so, you know, the, the capitalist urgings and drivers that are 
uh, contributing to the, the climate crisis. The reality is a lot of Southern communities, Black and Indigenous communities, have already been dealing with the realities that our climates are changing because they always are whether it's politically, whether it's environmentally, whether it's racial violence being done to us, we're always on the pivot. And I hate the word resilience, right? But we're we're resisting always. And so from that perspective, it was just, I know that like we brought up, I mean, Ida traveled North and I think it was just one of those moments where I would never want to say, I never really, I don't think that I told you so in like shaming model works, right? But there was just something that you didn't even have to say it because there were so many Northerners being like, well, why do y'all even bother with Louisiana? And then Ida, not even as a hurricane, as a tropical depression or some downgraded storm, killed people. It was devastating. And I think that for me solidified two things. Like one, the South, people got to really put their biases about the South and like really and their ignorances about the South aside because we are the region especially the deep South, especially the Gulf South that is going to lead and is already leading on how to deal with the realities of climate change. Nobody's coming to save us. No one, the, the people that saved each other, people who were stranded on roofs in Laplace, people who were drowning, community infrastructure saved those lives. Literally, that's it, period. FEMA, people in the Southwestern part of the state are still waiting for FEMA aid from hurricanes that happened August, 2020. Well, Co, I don't mind you saying I told you so, cause I, I feel like um, you absolutely have the right. I don't know if you're gonna quote yourself. So I'm gonna quote from your piece cause it was that good. Um, this is Co Bragg's piece. She says, climate change makes it clearer every waking day that it's coming for every single one of us. Even those who act like Gmail will survive the rapture. And I just think that framing of we're really in this together. And while we're so busy doing other things, that this is something off to the side was just like a, a massive takeaway for me and also just how I um, how I will run my media company. So I thank you for that. Um, Sarah, I wonder if I could put you and Charles on the spot about sure. launching EcoWord because you are one of those um, rare examples of cities in the north that was taking this seriously a few years ago. It's I don't know how many right. years ago you launched, but I just wonder um, kind of how how you thought of this and um, and also with your recent summit, if you want to kind of bring us back around to some of the uh, the lessons there. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Mitra. To answer your question, you know, in 2018, we wanted to take this this issue of environmental justice, environmental racism, and make it relevant and connect the dots for our community. And that's what we've been doing. And the, the EcoWord Environmental Justice Summit is an opportunity to do that um, in an expanded way. And this year we focused on community violence. As great as EcoWord is right now, we had a very successful summit, uh, very grassroots. Um, in fact, I was told that uh, by uh, a couple of people who are who've been in that environmental justice advocacy space for a long time. It was the first time they've seen an environmental justice conference or summit or convening run by black people, um, where you know basically black issues were being and and black conversation was centered in it. But unfortunately, we're still like I mean, and I've checked, we're the only like full time, fully operating black owned media outlet. Uh, that is covering environmental justice on a, on a regular dedicated basis. Um, I'd like more black media outlets to do that. Charles wrote this fascinating article um, for one of um, one of our our uh, local outlets and mapped out how environment and nature could actually reduce violence by 93 percent in Philadelphia if if collectively um, we we put all these pieces together. So Charles, you talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so, violence is a big conversation, for example, in Philadelphia right now. We've got, as, as of this conversation, we've got 453 people murdered in just this year alone. We, if you just pick up trash in the neighborhood, you reduce violent crime in that neighborhood by 9%. If you plant 10% more trees, you reduce that violent crime by 12%. If you uh, eliminate vacant lots, in a, um, in, a, in a neighborhood. You just reduce violence by nearly 30%. If you just upgrade and repair uh, dilapidated ho old homes 
in low-income Philadelphia neighborhoods, you reduce crimes uh, in that neighborhood by 25%. So, you know, once I gathered that all together, I'm like, wow, this sample neighborhood here just reduced violence by 93%. And, and on top of that, and this is another big question that we have to start answering, uh, particularly when we're talking to Black communities, um, you know, and, and, and really all, all distressed, low-income BIPOC communities. Hey, you know, am I going to get a job out of this? How does this improve my quality of life? Uh, absolutely, you'll get a job out of this by planting more trees, greening, um, creating more green infrastructure. You can create hundreds to thousands of new jobs. Most people who are who are going through environmental racism uh, every day uh, in all sorts of forms, or who are also uh, being devastated by the impacts of climate crisis, they don't have degrees in environmental science. So you have to talk about it. These are the benefits for you, for your household, for your neighborhood, for your kids. You know, in terms of jobs gained, uh, in terms of neighborhoods clean, improvement in quality of life, improved schools, everything. Just it's, it's totally, you know, saving that space or protecting that space. We've got to stop being episodic about the way we talk about climate crisis. We wait till the next disaster comes up. Then suddenly, oh, we're talking about climate crisis. We have got to make this like a pop culture conversation, especially as it relates to I can speak, you know, more specifically about the black community. I mean, if they're not if, if they're not talking about these issues back on the block, if it's not like daily on their radio stations, if, you know, pop culture mm -hmm. icons and celebrities aren't talking about it, um, you know, or it's not, you know, that conversation at the kitchen table or in the living room, they're not thinking about it and they're not going to mobilize or act on it. Gary, a lot of the um, Indian subcontinent feels like the West you know, you all had air conditioning for decades and decades, right? Globalization is much more recent in some of these markets. Um, and so there is this dynamic of the U.S. dictating to the rest of the world to clean up its act for its own original sins. I just wonder if you have any thoughts on that um, from the Haitian perspective or your your very global perspective. At the end of the day, at the bottom of of the road, it's 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 capitalism because a lot of these decisions are being made purely for for revenue for for growth. Where you know when you look at Lower Manhattan, right? We know we've known this for over hundred years that this place should not be habited. We should not build all these you know uh, buildings and 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 malls and all what have you. Well, it's part of hubris, but it's also greed. Because I think what's, what we see happening worldwide, I was looking the other day uh, online do, doing some research and you know, when Italy opened its high-speed rail, that was the end of Alitalia because Italians no longer had to fly because then Italy is a better off for it. And, and, and so can you imagine if we invested more money into Amtrak and we don't have to fly all over this big country? There are a lot of things, but the money that's being made in the airline industry, they, they, they'll fight it until, you know, they go out of business. <laughs> They'd rather go out of business and, uh, uh, and let the government invest in Amtrak and other clean energy. And so, you know, now it, it, it's they're even more cynical because now we hear every day about space travel. All these billionaires who they've made their money, they messed up the uh, the earth for us and then now they're going to live in space leave it up to us to clean up that's that's so that's so profound gary um we are um just about out of time but i wanted to just ask each of you and and i'll start with you co like what is the the climate story that you are following in your in your region sure. i think that this surfaced during ida but i think that the way that certain well, I'll say like indigenous tribes who are not federally recognized cannot get certain federal funds it is going to continue to be an issue in a story and something that I hope, um, you know, I saw some stories about, you know, about this, like right after Ida, but it's something that is going to continue, that has long been an issue. And that also I want to have more indigenous storytellers tackle because it's one of those things where people swoop in, get the story and leave. And especially because indigenous um, people are going to be the are have led and will continue to lead us towards 
um, sustainability and um, care for our climate, that like those stories are really important to me, especially in Louisiana. Excellent. Charles, what's the story you're pursuing? Uh, you know, I, I still want to further explore uh, this correlation between violence and the environment. Uh, it's not just Philadelphia, every major city, every major urban city where um, there's a, a very significant concentration of black people um, is, is experiencing spikes in violent crime. Uh, and, and that's accelerated, that's exacerbated during pandemic. Um, and we're, we're really underestimating the power of what they call place-based interventions and place-based strategies and helping mitigate or uh, close to totally eliminate that violence. Um, and it could, it could actually um, create a whole new angle or, or ripple effect in that police accountability conversation. You know, just by using place-based strategies, you don't need police all the time to, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to achieve optimal public safety in our communities. So I think that that's still an underreported conversation. Definitely we're having more of it in Philadelphia, uh, but I'd like to see that, uh, that conversation take place nationwide. Excellent. And Gary, how about you? What What's a, a climate story that you're, you're interested in? Well, it's not just a story. It's a beat that we want to develop because I think the, the issue is too, too important. I think that it's the biggest challenge that Haiti faces. And we want to tell the story about what's happening. There are some positive things going on. And so we're always looking for positive stories out of Haiti. And there are some to be told around the climate issue in Haiti. Excellent. Well, I want to thank all of the participants in our URL roundtable today, Co Bragg from Scalawag, Gary Pierre Pierre from Haitian Times, and Charles Ellison from WURD and EcoWord. Thank you all so much for this conversation. There's much, much more to cover, and we'll continue the dialogue. Thanks. Well, that was a great conversation, you two. Thank you so much for bringing it here to the program. I learned a lot from these Meet the BIPOC Press um, weeks. And on this occasion, I was so taken, well, with two things. One, what Co reported about the so-called mainstream, we call it just the money media's focus on New Orleans as, well, it didn't flood. Let's move right on. If people want to hear more about what happened after Ida that wasn't reported, Scalawag's been doing great. And uh, we had Colette Pichon battle on the show right after the hurricane. She had a lot to say about the kind of, you know, the, the actual fatalities and the toll that was felt uh, that that Co talked about. That's a few weeks back on, on this program. The other thing I thought about as you made that connection between violence and the climate was some colleagues of ours at, in Amsterdam at the Transnational Institute did a study and looked at the spending of the nation of the world's biggest greenhouse gas emitters on climate finance, helping countries adapt to climate change and help people who would otherwise migrate, how much they spend on that versus how much they spend on militarizing the border. And, you know, no big surprise, the top seven emitters spend something like twice as much cumulatively on the border than they do on, on climate finance. And some countries like Canada, I just looked at the numbers, spent 15 times as much on policing than on helping people and nations uh, respond to climate change. We know that um, there is money that is being misplaced and misdirected to kind of militarize the police, continue to double down on um, kind of criminal justice and, and a focus on, um, on punitive measures when we could really look at it from a very different vantage point. And that's what we're trying to explore in, in this conversation and just beyond really trying to say, how do we take an integrated holistic approach that centers nature and the environment and honors it and, and allows that to be the place that, um, that, we, that we start from, as opposed to it, it again exists over there and we think about it a separate and apart from everything else that we're trying to address. This is something you write about a lot at Epicenter, right, Mitra? Absolutely. This is the classic um, dilemma in migration that we're we're choosing not only to not be open to literally the world's refugees, but we're also, to your point, militarizing our borders. We're not 
effectively creating, con we're, we're actually supporting the conditions in other countries that lead to migration. Ko's point was so strong. This has been a conversation delayed by racism. Uh, and what you were all doing is, is speeding up the clock on us getting smarter and wiser. So I, I want to thank you absolutely for bringing us these amazing stories every month and look forward to the next Meet the BIPOC Press um, in the month ahead.